we'd like to acknowledge our sponsor, uh, Adva Health, for supporting lung cancer programs like our session today. Um, without further ado, I'd like to pass it on to Dr. Mark A. Sosinski to begin his presentation. Uh, so Dr. Sosinski, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Ty, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, as you can see, as the slide says, we all know it's Lung Cancer Awareness Month. And I've kind of uh, gathered some, uh, as I call them, perspectives here to uh, hopefully uh, provide um, uh, an educational hour or so uh, about the disease. Now, I've been a lung cancer doc now for 30 years and certainly been involved in a number of clinical trial investigations over that time period. So we've, uh, the good news is we've come a long way. If we can go to the next slide. And, uh, and I think, you know, much of the reasons that we have come a long way in lung cancer, as I'll show you on the next slide, is that we've uh, had an increasing understanding of the biology and molecular nature of lung cancer. This is a, a wheel that we refer to as, oops, oops, uh, yeah, a, a wheel that we re refer to as the hallmarks of cancer. And, and again, these are all important aspects of dysregulated growth uh, that, of which cancer is. Now, understanding this has brought us a number of uh, new therapies. And if you go to the next slide, this is some recent uh, data from just published late uh, last month uh, in cancer, looking at the um, national cancer statistics as they relate to cancer death rates. And you can see, uh, if you look at just in the bottom here, this is, looks at both male and female mortality from cancer. Uh, you can see we've seen a continued decrease over the past two decades. And some of the de uh, steepest declines that we've seen up to uh, at least 4% per year um, have been reported in uh, two cancers um, that historically have been labeled as uh, difficult to treat cancers, that would be lung cancer and melanoma. So if you go to the next slide, Michelle, um, uh, it kind of gives us uh, the big picture of lung cancer. I, I like to refer to lung cancer as public enemy number one when it comes to um, uh, cancer. It's the most common cancer in the world. Uh, you can see that um, although we're doing better with cancer-related deaths, it still is responsible for more cancer-related deaths than breast, uh, prostate, and colorectal cancer combined. So the next slide um, has really, it very at a very top level, has kind of um, uh, kind of outlines our increasing understanding of this disease as a very heterogeneous group of patients. Uh, when we say lung cancer or non-small cell lung cancer. Non-small cell lung cancer comprises a number of different um, uh, subsets of lung cancer that are defined either by molecular biomarkers uh, or by pdl one status. If we go to the next slide, uh, you can see this is the typical way we quantitate pdl one On the two ends, you have uh, to the right um, a very strong, uh, uh, that, brown, that brown color in the slide there, this is the biopsy of the tumor, that brown stuff is expression of PDL1. Obviously, this is very high expression. To the far left, you see none of that. So that would be a PDL1 negative population. And then in the middle, you see kind of some scant brownish there. So that would be weak uh, positive. And th these are important for helping us make decisions about what to do. So that molecular classification and the IHC classification for PDL1, uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, Michelle, you know, we we've really ushered in uh, two important eras. And I like to say lung cancer has really become the poster child for targeted therapy as well as immunotherapy. And you can see that over the past uh, you know, 10 to 15 years or so, we've begun and incorporated all of these targeted therapies and immunotherapy into our treatment strategy. And I think this is finally paying off. If we go to the next slide, Michelle, um, you can see that lung cancer has become a molecular disease. There are a number of subsets of lung cancer that are defined only by uh, analyzing the tumor DNA and RNA in a fashion to find these molecular subsets. And the reason why this is important, you see them to the left, if we go to the next slide, um, you can see that over the past uh, decade or so, we have 
seen approvals uh, by the FDA of a number of different targeted therapies. On the top half of the slide are the four uh, uh, fusions that we um, uh, need to um, test for in lung cancer, number of approved agents on the bottom are the current five mutations that we have in non-small cell lung cancer. So we're getting to a point where we are being a, a, a more precise uh, and certainly more personalized by looking at the, all of these targets. And if you go to the next slide, again, this looks at uh, the 10 approved targeted therapies in all of these molecular uh, subsets. Um, uh, actually, Michelle, if you go to the next slide, and the reason these are approved, and this is kind of a busy slide, but this just looks at uh, what we call waterfall plots. And what a waterfall plot does is look at how much your tumor shrinks. And you can see as you go to the right across all of these, and these are all FDA approved uh, uh, agents except for the bottom right um, in the top right uh, in the HER2 space. But if you look at the three to the left, these are all FDA approved drugs. And you can see that almost all patients are having shrinkage of their tumor. So if you have a molecular target and you treat that patient with a molecular targeted agent, the results in terms of tumor shrinkage and duration of that shrinkage are dramatically better. This is not something we see with chemotherapy and not something we see with immunotherapy in these populations. So again, this is the reason why we have this um, number of targeted agents. But Again, in order to use these drugs, uh, you have to do comprehensive molecular testing to find out if you have one of these either fusions or mutations uh, where these drugs are helpful. Now, in a separate type of patient, go to the next slide, um, Michelle. This uh, does remind us that um, a cancer essentially, for all intents and purposes, is a foreign body uh, in us, and our immune system should be able to um, should be able to recognize the cancer as being a foreign body, mount an immune response. Uh, those T cells should be able to get to the tumor and kill the tumor. And in a perfect world, uh, this would happen. Unfortunately, uh, in a in a in in the world of cancer, the cancer develops a number of protective mechanisms against the immune system. And if you recall, I didn't point it out on the first slide I showed, but one of the hallmarks of cancer is to avoid immune destruction. Um, and one of the ways that it does that is by using a number of immune checkpoint inhibitors where it kind of turns off the immune system. Now, uh, having said that, we've developed a number of drugs, uh, principally in lung cancer, PD-1 and PD-L1 uh, antibodies, and if you go to the next slide, actually, uh, this is a slide uh, that I refer to as the immunotsunami of lung cancer indications in the immunotherapy world. And you can see on the bottom, these are a number of phase three trials that uh, led to FDA approval. This is looking at using immunotherapy alone. And then on the top, uh, the chemotherapy combinations with immunotherapy. And Michelle, if you go to the next slide, uh, just last week, uh, to the far right, you see the word Poseidon in Empower Lung 1. We had two more indications last week or last cu couple of weeks that have added to, again, as I call this slide, the immunotsunami. And all of this drug development, go to the next slide, Michelle. If you, if you look at this slide, you know, this is, a, th this is really telling that if, if uh, as I mentioned before, we, we, we have seen a decreasing uh, uh, lung cancer mortality, and many much of it is, is due to the development of these new agents, both the targeted agents as well as the immunotherapy agents. And you can see that um, the changes in total death over the past 20 years have been most marked, as I mentioned before, in melanoma and in lung cancer. So development of new cancer medications is actually quite important. Now, if we go to the next slide, I'm going to transition into a slide about uh, the research and development process for new drugs. Uh, we all want new and better therapies, but it takes a while and it's quite expensive. Uh, if you look at the history of our clinical trials over the past uh, de uh, one or two decades or so, they've become increasingly complex. In the bottom left, 
uh, you see in the in the table there, uh, just looking at phase three protocols and what uh, things such as endpoints, procedures, eligibility criteria, number of sites, uh, data points collected, you can see uh, the change from around the turn of the century to a decade or so later. They've become significantly more complex. And with that complexity of these clinical trials, you see, you see there that the cost of developing these clinical trials uh, has increased uh, quite uh, significantly. And then who bears the uh, uh, responsibility of that cost? And you can see to, to the right, uh, it's a mixture, but mostly by the private sector, uh, private industry, although obviously the public sector uh, also uh, plays an important part. Now, having coupled this increasing cost and increasing complexity, we've seen, if you go to the next slide, um, Michelle, that the return on investment for the development of these many uh, late-stage pipeline drugs uh, over the last 10 years has been shrinking, uh, and that's likely due to the increasing cost of doing clinical trials. So this is uh, uh, important in this setting. Now, if you go to the next slide, um, transitioning into uh, the geographic disparity of lung cancer. You can see to the left is the NCI map story about cancer mortality rates. Obviously, the red states are we, where we see the highest mortality. And then, obviously, to the right, it's the percentage change in mortality rate over about a 30 to 40-year period. And you can see a very similar uh, mirroring of the highest uh, percent change in mortality rate correlating roughly with the states that are red. Um, so we know that lung cancer varies depending upon what geography uh, that you are in. Now, if you go to the next slide, uh, another issue there is if we've been uh, developing all of these great therapies for patients, uh, are we getting the great therapies to all these patients? And I'll just draw your attention to the lower right bar graph and the lower right hand section of this uh, slide. You can see it's labeled as stage four, and you can see in this uh, database uh, shown here, and this is from 1998 to 2012, about 25% of patients with stage four never get any treatment. Now, there might be multiple reasons as to why that's the case, but again, you can have the greatest medication in the world, but if you don't get it, it really doesn't matter. And that, uh, if you go to the next slide, you can see that like I showed with the cancer mortality rate, that there is state-by-state -state differences uh, with regard to the lack of treatment in lung cancer. Some states do better than others. Uh, the, uh, in terms of looking at the last five years or so, uh, interestingly, that North Dakota has uh, been a winner. Arizona has kind of been a loser in this uh, um, session. So the next slide uh, looks at um, the issue of, um, oops, yeah, um, the you know disparities and barriers to uh, treatment. So I've, I've listed their immunotherapies and targeted therapies certainly have improved outcomes. But again, as I've mentioned, if you don't get these drugs, then um, they can they, they really can't help you. So so why do we have these issues and disparities and stuff like this? So lots of obviously contributing factors, uh, social determinants of health, where people live, as I've mentioned. Uh, where they work, uh, insurance issues, uh, variability in the quality of care, and both patient level and system level factors. So it's important to recognize these uh, because if you go to the next slide, these are really pervasive uh, across the entire um, lung cancer population, as we call it, the impact pyramid, starting way down at the bottom with preventive measures, so tobacco control, and then management uh, of uh, nodules, lung cancer screening, treatment selection, so on and so forth. Now, I want to spend a second uh, on the next slide just reminding everybody that uh, screening works. This is the data from the National Lung Screening Trial looking at low-dose CT scans. You can see that the low-dose CT scan did uh, decrease the death, uh, number of deaths from lung cancer, about a 20% reduction in lung cancer mortality. Um, and you can see in the a box to the bottom right that the cost per life year saved, at least in 2012 dollars, was really quite in line with other solid tumors that we screen for, cervical cancer, breast cancer, and colorectal cancer. 
The next slide shows a, a separate trial that was more recently published, the Nelson trial, that showed a very similar reduction in cancer mortality, actually a bit more in females than in males. So interesting data from the Nelson trial. Now, when you look at how well we do, next slide they, uh, there, Michelle, um, next, yeah, here. Um, despite knowing that screening um, saves lives, uh, you can see that very few of the patients uh, that are eligible to be screened um, get lung cancer screening. Um, and so that's an interesting fact. And you look at the lung cancer burden to the left, I showed you a different version of that slide there versus uh, the screening centers at the state level. You can see there's certainly disparities in parts of the country where uh, lung cancer screening uh, availability may be not optimal in this population. And if you look on the next slide, this is uh, data from a large uh, data set. I can't remember. Yeah, the uh, BRFSS is the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance uh, System. And what this uh, study looked at was patients who would have met the United States Preventive Services Task Force criteria for lung cancer screening. It looked at three states, uh, the states that I live in, Florida, Nevada, and Georgia. Um, and of the patients that would have fit the criteria for screening, only 16% of patients were screened. Now, it was better than it was uh, in earlier years where it was less than 6%, but I've highlighted the number of patients or the percentage of patients that receive low-dose CT screening. Uh, and uh, you can see at the bottom in the red there, 19%, 7%, and 11%. So we have a ways to go with regard to screening uh, in terms of making sure that everyone who's eligible uh, for it uh, should get it. Um, to me, this is uh, mostly a, pri well, not mostly, it is a primary care issue. It's not an issue in my world because I obviously as a, am a lung cancer doctor. I, I'm a very big advocate for screening, but it's not the patient population that I see because I see a patient population that already has the disease. These are patients that are at risk for the disease and should be screened. Next slide. Now, getting back to um, issues of disparity. Uh, so we know against, uh, across uh, racial and ethnic populations that there are differences um, in terms of early diagnosis, uh, the ability to get surgical treatment, and, and the, the, the ability to get any treatment. And you can see uh, to the far right, the bar graphs compare three different populations uh, to white Americans. It's uh, Latino Americans on the top, Black Americans in the middle and Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders on the bottom. And you can see that these populations are less likely to be diagnosed early. Some are less likely to get surgical treatment and more likely to get no treatment whatsoever. Uh, so it's important to recognize this. Now, next slide gets back to uh, the points I made about targeted therapy. And again, you can't use any of the active targeted agents if you don't do the testing. And we can see that as a whole, if you um, look to the bottom left where it says study period, April, 2018 to March, 2020, and you look over to the right at the bottom of that bar graph where it says all five, you can see that only about 50% of the patients during this study period received uh, testing to include just the five biomarkers that are listed in the table to the upper left. Now, I told you that the FDA currently has 10 biomarkers. So if we don't do very well at getting five, we probably don't do very well at getting 10. 10 is the standard of care uh, in 2022. You can see to the right in the flat iron uh, EHR derived data, but there are some disparities. Black populations are less likely to be tested uh, less likely to use the standard of care, which is next generation sequencing. And so these are important aspects. So we have to admit we're still missing the mark and, and we have to address these disparities. Next slide. And it also uh, is known that there are disparities in clinical trial participation with black populations participating less. It might be lots of reasons for that, uh, but we need to address whatever the obstacles or barriers may be. 
And then next slide here is the last slide on clinical trials, and that is kind of good news, bad news um, um, information here. The good news is, is that we have many, many drugs being developed based, again, on our understanding of how lung cancer works, defining targets. You can see they've more than tripled in the past two decades. And this is uh, unique to oncology versus the non-oncology drugs. Uh, as a consequence of that, uh, if you're trying to develop more drugs in cancer, it's harder to find participants that fit these very selective inclusion exclusion criteria for these clinical trials. And so we have to recognize and be a bit more, either get more patients to see the value in clinical trials and participate in them, uh, or um, make some decisions about what the high priority drugs are. And you see in the very bottom bullet there in, two, in uh, phase two oncology trials, only 14% of participants screened were enrolled and eventually completed the trial, uh, I think because of the complexity of that trial, versus 54% in non-oncology trials. So really that, that, that's an issue. Lastly, I just want to recognize uh, the interplay between cancer and financial distress. Uh, this looks at, uh, we've seen a lot of information mostly coming from uh, the ASCO bulletin that all of us get uh, in the morning and talking about the financial implications of a cancer diagnosis. Uh, we know they are quite significant in that uh, this puts a lot of patients in jeopardy. The um, uh, pre-illness issues with regard to how healthy are you, uh, what, what are your personal habits, are you a smoker, not a smoker, uh, what's your income status, your employment status, these sorts of things. When you have the diagnosis of cancer, there are lots of cancer-related costs and financial consequences of those costs to the far right. If you go to the next slide, Michelle, uh, when you uh, start to look at what cancer patients are facing, you can see that there are a number of financial concerns uh, that are both non-medical as well as medical. And I think that all of these uh, really drive the cost of burden on patients, sometimes more than prescription drugs, although that's a whole separate issue here. Um, and uh, when you ask patients, there was a, a survey here in, in this sort of thing, uh, you know, that uh, 70 to 80% of patients um, uh, report that there are significant uh, moderate to severe financial hardships from cancer-related uh, ex expenses. Um, it may affect your employment. That may or may not affect your insurance status. All these sorts of things that we don't necessarily think about from our side of the fence because we're trying to uh, make the best treatment decisions, that sort of thing. But I think they have to be recognized. And the next slide uh, is my next to the last slide. But this uh, re reminds us that a cancer diagnosis can be a big hit for patients. Two-thirds of patients who were working full-time had to either stop working or reduce their hours. It affects caregivers. And more than a quarter of them had to make extended employment changes. Out-of-pocket costs driven by physician and facility care uh, are significant. Uh, Co-insurance and deductibles, these sorts of things shift more cost onto patients. And uh, this is a major issue, and, and it can be a really challenging issue on a case-by-case -case basis. So, Michelle, my last slide here is my uh, kind of take-home messages slide, if you will. Uh, we should be proud of the work we do in cancer. We are making uh, improvement in outcomes and moving the bar. Uh, really, <coughs> clinical research is the engine that drives the progress, and we need to continue to develop our clinical trials of new therapies, but also think of ways to make sure that we answer the question, is a new therapy really better? Um, and that's really getting clinical trials um, done in a timely fashion. The disparities issue was to remind us that unfortunately all patients are not created equal. And I think we have to be aware of this and, and develop strategies uh, that really provide state-of-the-art cancer care for all of our uh, population. And again, this issue of a, the financial stress that a cancer diagnosis can bring, I think, is not insignificant. So having said all that, I will turn it back to Ty, and I think we have time for questions here. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Sosinski, for that wonderful presentation and all that insight. Let's go ahead and start the question and answer session.
Um, as we think about uh, questions for folks that are live, we're going to go into some of the questions that were given in uh, from those that registered earlier. Uh, the first question is uh, CMET overexpression in non small uh, lung cancer EGFR wild type. Is there a need for an actionable biomarker in CMET? Well, I would say the short answer to that is there's always a need for a biomarker. We know that CMET as a target is potentially important. Um, we know that there's overexpression in a number of patients. Uh, we have drugs that target CMET. And in individual patients, these CMET targeting drugs can have very significant results. The issue there is can we identify the patients prospectively with current measures we don't do as well as I think we need to do. So I would say, uh, yes, I would welcome a biomarker to tell me which patients uh, with a wild type EGFR are going to have significant benefit from CMAT targeting drugs. Thank you for that. Uh, next question is on uh, biomarker KRAS G12C, adenocarcinoma non-small cell uh, stage 2A, uh, touching lining of right lung, 4.2 centimeters, currently on tachentric, uh, tumor completely removed, could not continue chemotherapy, carboplatin and gemzar. I am, uh, I had my last treatment of uh, tachentric one year on it. Uh, so any comments there? Well, so the patient uh, in this case was, it sounds like they were treated in the adjuvant setting. So they had surgical resection. Uh, they had um, uh, some chemotherapy, maybe couldn't complete the whole course, which is not terribly unusual. It's tough chemotherapy in that setting. And then they got a year of um, tocentric or atezolizumab as adjuvant immunotherapy in that setting. Um, yeah, they're known to have a G12C. Uh, we do have G12C drugs. At this point, uh, since um, your earlier stage, in fact, stage two here, uh, the indication for uh, the currently approved drug, Sotorastib, as the G12C drug, is for stage four patients who have had prior chemotherapy. So we don't know the role of uh, the G12C targeting drugs in this setting. So I would say if you're a year away from immunotherapy, I would personally, I would declare a victory and just continue to follow you. I wouldn't do anything else at this time. Thank you for that. Uh, next question. For a patient with stage four lung cancer, non-small cell adenocarcinoma, is there a treatment available once Lumacress um, ceases to work daily? Well, yeah, yeah. Obviously, here the devil is in the details here. Uh, so, um, if if you've um, used uh, uh, soda rapid, the drug to refer to uh, by the brand name, um, uh, typically, the, as I mentioned before, that would be in the second line setting. So, we're really talking about third line treatment options. There are certainly treatment options. There are also probably multiple clinical trials that you might. Uh, that the patient might be eligible for. It really all, all depends on the fitness of the patient for third-line treatment. If, if the patient's still in good shape, I would move on to third-line treatment. There are a number of standard options uh, that are available there, but more importantly, I might seek an innovative clinical trial before I try the standard options to see if there might be something unique and innovative for you um, in that particular setting. Thank you for that. Um, next question. Uh, how frequently should liquid biopsy be, be performed or monitoring of patients on TKIs? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, and I think a fairly controversial question at this point. There's no doubt that liquid biopsy at the time of diagnosis is an important complementary technology to tissue biopsy and identifying patients with molecular alterations. So it's very important. In my patients, I, uh, you know, they all have tissue biopsy. They have variable quality of that tissue biopsy. I always do a liquid biopsy at the same time because we know that doing tissue in liquid does increase the number of molecular alterations that you will find uh, in the lung cancer population. The controversial part is how do you use it after that? And what does it tell you that the patient doesn't tell you or the CAT scan doesn't tell you? 
Uh, and that's this issue of measuring in serial times. These are not inexpensive tests. And what I struggle with is the clinical utility of doing serial measures at this time. Now, there are a number of clinical trials ongoing that are looking at specifically this question. To me, in my practice, we have established beyond a shadow of a doubt the clinical utility of a liquid biopsy at the time of diagnosis. Monitoring serially over time, I think in lung cancer, is still considered um, investigational. Uh, particularly in the stage four disease, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm less interested in it. Where I think uh, there, it could be of great value is in the stage one and two surgical disease, where you know many of these patients we will go ahead and treat uh, with adjuvant uh, treatment. But I do think that there are a proportion of patients that are cured by surgery and don't need further treatment. My colleagues in colorectal cancer are using liquid biopsies to determine whether or not a patient with resected colon cancer should receive adjuvant therapy. I see in the future that we will probably be using that in lung cancer. We don't have that data today, but I think that's probably going to be the most useful aspect of um, looking at serial liquid biopsies over time is in the earlier stages of disease. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, a couple of questions that are similar in theme that I'm going to put together. Um, how hard is it to treat recurring lung cancer, and how often should you have a new biomarker test? Well, it's, um, you know, again, it's, it's quite uh, variable um, um, in terms of how difficult it is to treat, and it depends on how many times it's recurred and what you've had for treatment before and what your molecular makeup might be. So there are lots of variables that go into the first part of that question. Um, uh, there are a number of situations in which a repeat biopsy may be informative in terms of telling your doctor what to do. The best example of that, and I'll just give you one example, because this is not the only example, but it's the one that is most pertinent to everyday practice. In those patients who have EGFR mutations and receive a TKI in the first line setting, when that TKI, which is an EGFR TKI, stops working, about 30% of the patients in which this happens have MET amplification. We talked about MET before. We have some pretty good MET drugs, and there's certainly growing evidence that treating with a MET drug or adding a MET drug to the EGFR TKI can provide clinical utility. So that's an example where retesting from a molecular point uh, of view could be very informative for that patient. That's just one example. Thank you. Uh, next question. How reliable and how much should we consider results of CA125 and CEA for someone with lung cancer stage 3A using Tegriso? Yeah, I I don't I don't draw two remarkers like CA125 and CEA. I, I I don't think they're the standard of care. They can sometimes be misleading. Um, they are they're not incorporated in any of our tumor response criteria for lung cancer. We use mostly resist criteria, which is CT based. So I follow CT scans because I really don't know how to use these tumor markers. And I, in my practice, I don't draw them. Uh, when I was a fellow way back when at the Dana-Farber, uh, we did a study looking at five different tumor markers. CEA and CA125 were part of that study, as well as a few others. And, um, and, and we dismissed the value of doing it on a serial basis because it didn't provide information above and beyond what uh, you get from, a, say, a C CT scan, a physical exam, talking to the patient, these sorts of things. So I would say the clinical utility of them has not been firmly established, and I don't do them in my practice. Gotcha. Thank you for that insight. Um, next question. Uh, I'm attending this webinar to learn about biomarkers and also for school. I need to get a virtual signature. Uh, next. Uh, so this is a, probably something we can handle outside. Um, uh, so the next question after that would be, is, is a doctor referral usually required? So if so, what would I tell my doctor to justify a referral? So I'm assuming for biomarker testing. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not quite sure I 
quite understand that question. Um, um, bi biomarker testing in lung cancer is, is the standard of care. It should be done routinely. It's much like doing estrogen, progesterone, receptor, and HER2 status in breast cancer. It's this, it is an accepted standard of care. The NCCN recommends that all of these biomarkers get tested on a broad-based comprehensive platform like next generation sequencing. Uh, and that can be done in blood as we've just talked about. Um, so I, I don't think you, um, I don't think you need a referral of any sort if you're, if you, if you, um, a referral for biomarker um, testing. So I'm not quite sure if that's, that's the question that's being asked here uh, or what specifically, and if someone, in the audience to either ask the question or wants more clarity on it, um, please um, unmute and, and ask me. Definitely. I think you may have hit the point there, but definitely uh, audience members, you can you can uh, chime in. And we'll be getting to those questions shortly as well uh, as we get through the remainder of these uh, registering questions. Um, is there a research to indicate the percentage of key true to patients uh, experiencing EGFR mutation after two to three years of treatment? Usually EGFR mutation is present at the time of diagnosis and doesn't emerge over time. And I've not seen any information that that's an issue with patients who are on pembrolizumab or K-Truda. Um, so I'm not aware that that's a, that's a problem over, over time. Thank you for that. Um, following question, lower left clobectomy stage 1A, EGFR positive, never smoker, female, no nodes, no METs. Does targeted therapy help recurrence for any micrometastasis? Well, you know, the indication for adjuvant EGFR TKI is in stage 1B. Uh, through 3A. Um, so uh, as, if it's a stage 1A, a very small tumor, I mean, the good news is probably cured by lung cancer, uh, by, by, by sur surgical resection. Um, uh, of course, the details of the 1A might be a little helpful. Uh, we're told there's no lymph node involvement, no other disease involvement. Uh, size makes a difference, but the 1As are typically less than two centimeters, so they're pretty small tumors. Um, the standard of care is observation and surveillance. Uh, there's no evidence that, uh, well, we don't have any evidence that um, using an EGFR TKI in the adjuvant setting in stage 1A is the right thing to, to do. So in my practice, I have a number of patients uh, just like this, actually. Um, I saw a couple of them yesterday, actually, in my clinic. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're doing uh, periodic CT scans and follow-ups and these sorts of things, but they are not on active treatment. Thank you for that. Um, this next question is about heredity, uh, hereditary lung cancer. My mother recently died of non-small cell lung cancer with uh, EGFR mutation. Should, I, should my siblings and I test for biomarkers? Should, I, uh, should our children be tested? I don't know whether my mother was an inherent uh, EGFR mutation. Uh, would there have been a test to indicate that? What are your thoughts there? Um, you know, again, the devil's in the details here. My thoughts about this are, it is true that lung cancer does run in families. So there, there appears to be a genetic component to lung cancer. What the susceptibility genes are is not entirely clear at this point. There are some families that do have what we refer to as germline mutations in EGFR. I don't know if that was the case here. Um, now, the difference between, there is a difference between the DNA of your normal self and the DNA of your cancer. We refer to the DNA of your normal self as germline DNA, and we refer to the DNA of uh, the cancer as, som uh, as somatic DNA or somatic mutations. So you can have germline mutations and somatic mutations. The somatic is what we're interested in in cancer medicine. The germline mutations are what you should be interested in in terms of family members being at, at risk. So, um, uh, you know, if, if, if you want to kind of put this question to bed, uh, I would see a genetic counselor um, with this family history and see that. 
we, we don't know that there's any special biomarker testing anything. The only thing that would come to my mind is I did mention the value of screening. Uh, now, um, the current screening guidelines uh, require you, you to be of a certain age and to have a smoking history. So the screening may not necessarily be covered at this particular point. Um, so that's, a, that, that's another issue in terms of um, thinking about this. But, but those are my thoughts about that question. Thank you. Uh, great, great answer there. Um, what are the best practices around second round biomarker testing after TKI breakthrough in EGFR positive non-small cell lung cancer? Yeah, I, I, again, I use the example of MET amplification following progression on a first line TKI. So, so I, I do think that um, retesting specifically in an EGFR mutation positive patients uh, can be informative. It isn't informative all the time. So you may retest and you may not necessarily have uh, something that you're going to act on, uh, but you might. I mentioned the 30% rate of MET amplification where you might employ a MET inhibitor. Uh, there are other things that have been described, other bypass tracks. The one that comes to mind immediately is RET fusion. Uh, BRAF uh, mutations have been described. So there are other potential targets that you might find on retesting. Uh, but again, the risk is, is that it's not informative. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, last question from the registrants, and then we'll move on to um, the live chat. Uh, why is stage four non-small cell uh, lung cancer exon 19 not eligible for immunotherapy or surgery? Well, stage four uh, surgical options are really only for stage one, two, and selected three, three A's and B's. Um, so stage four um, would not necessarily be uh, uh, a, 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 a surgical option. Now, having said that, there are extremely rare cases in which you might think about in highly selected stage four patients of doing surgery. Let's say you had a spot in the lung and a spot in your brain. Uh, we operate on those patients. Technically, they're stage four, but they're rare and it's a different biology we all believe. Um, now, getting back to the in EGFR mutation positive disease, um, these patients typically are, are not smokers. Um, and the data we have with immunotherapy, at least as immunotherapy monotherapy giving by itself, it doesn't really have significant activity uh, in those EGFR mutant patients. This is not a very uh, immune uh, sensitive population. The immune system is really not uh, necessarily engaged in these patients. It's more of a TKI disease or chemotherapy disease. So, so that, you know, many of us would shy away. And there's also a risk of mixing the TKIs with immunotherapy that could result in greater side effects. Uh, so you have to be careful there using immunotherapy in the EGFR mutation positive population. Thank you for that, Dr. Zinsky. All right, moving on to the chat. Uh, Janelle Hom asks, uh, great information on screening and the need to do better. Curious to Dr. Sosinski's thoughts as to when we may see a movement to conduct and cover lung cancer screenings for those without the smoking pack history. There are certain people who develop lung cancer who do not have smoking history. And uh, thinking about the barrier for people to figure out if they're even eligible to be screened under the current guidelines. Any thoughts there? Yeah. Yeah, I don't disagree with um, with increasing screening. Uh, I, I certainly um, do that. One of the things you have to be careful about is there are a lot of things we see with uh, lung cancer screening that turn out not to be cancer. And so these can give rise to unneeded procedures, unneeded anxiety and level of concern and these sorts of things. So, um, you know, when the initial screening studies were done, they were certainly done in a population that was at the very highest risk of developing lung cancer. Age and smoking status were the criteria. Um, and we demonstrated in that population that's at high risk of getting lung cancer that there is a reduction in mortality. In populations that have a lower risk of lung cancer, not zero, but a lower risk, you're gonna to have to screen many, 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 many more patients to show a very similar benefit. Um, and that's kind of a public um, uh, policy that uh, uh, issue from my point of view. Um, you know, how, how many of these patients do you need to screen to save a life? 
Um, certainly in a low risk population, it's going to be a large number of screened patients before you save one life. If you have a high risk population, it's going to be a lower number of patients screened there. So I think it's a great question. Um, um, you know, with a strong family history, I would certainly endorse it. Uh, but we just need more data in this area to really get some good guardrails around what we should be doing. Absolutely. Uh, great answer there. Uh, follow up question. Also, going back to biomarker testing, can you speak more to what barriers exist uh, when it comes to insurance coverage for those tests? Um, and from a preventative measure, uh, some of us uh, may have been suggested by primary care physicians to have a biomarker test done based on family history only to find insurance won't cover it. Yeah. Um... Uh, you know, complicated uh, question in terms of the insurance coverage sort of thing. Um, um, and obviously, again, this is another situation where the devil is in the details. This is something you should further discuss with your physician to see if there's a an avenue for appeal or or just how important it is. That's what stuff. It's hard for me to uh, comment on the specifics of any one situation. Yeah, absolutely, it gets kind of tricky there. Um, we are at the top of the hour, Dr. Sosinski. If you want to continue with questions, we can continue. If not, um, we can conclude here. I'll take one more. Okay. All righty. Uh, what drugs do you use today for CMAT? Uh, uh, the, um, the, uh, is it uh, j just in general? Yeah, so uh, it doesn't so, go into so, any detail. Okay, so the 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 MET drugs that are they're currently approved for a specific situation are called um, MET exon 14 skip mutation. Now there is activity in uh, CMET overexpression or amplification too, but that's not the approval. The two drugs that are out there are a drug called capmatinib and a drug called tapotinib. Um, another drug called crizotinib does have some MET activity, but I would not necessarily put that at the head of the class, so to speak. I would think about either capmatinib or, um, or tapotinib. There is also a bispecific antibody called amivantamab that targets both EGFR and CMET. Um, so that is a, a possibility in patients with CMET uh, disorders also. All right, thank you, Dr. Szynski, for that answer there. Uh, just a few closing remarks. Um, please visit lung.org uh, for valuable resources for lung cancer patients or loved ones. Um, we offer the Lung Helpline, dial 1-800-LUNG-USA to connect. Uh, we also have mentorship programs and online support communities on our website. Um, and as a part of this webinar, we ask participants to fill out a brief uh, evaluation survey to help us continue to improve the meetup on the Go series. Uh, this information will be sent to you in an email, so keep an eye out. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Szynski, for a wonderful presentation and discussion. Take care, everyone. Well, thank you. Bye-bye.